Okay, that should be, uh, I know other folks will probably be joining us, but uh, uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming today. And you know, we're here to discuss uh, one of our favorite uh, subjects, which is transportation and infrastructure. And this webinar is uh, about how the federal funding is going to affect infrastructure and transportation uh, here in the Bay Area. So uh, we have a terrific conversation, really important conversation today about the IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. This is Jim Wonderman, the president and CEO of the Bay Area Council. Uh, we have a, a terrific uh, panel with us here. Uh, uh, Congressman uh, Mark Desaulnier, very uh, important person in the Bay Area. I won't take you through Mark's whole uh, CV or anyone's because Every, everyone you're gonna hear from has tremendous experience, but you know, Mark has been a public servant for much of his career after being in the private sector and is a, a devout supporter of transportation and serves on uh, the transportation uh, committee in Congress. And so he's got a front, uh, more than just a front row seat to the action, as does uh, the executive director of the Metropolitan Transportation uh, Commission, uh, Therese McMillan, uh, who has uh, served with MTC through much of her career, but also spent a lot of time in uh, Washington at the Department of Transportation, as well as in the uh, as in Los Angeles, uh, working on transportation there. And Darlene G uh, is a senior vice president at HNTB, one of the major companies uh, in the country producing uh, the infrastructure when funding comes along to produce it. And uh, in her more important role. She's the co-chair of the Bay Area Council's Transportation uh, Committee. So she's a, been a real stalwart member of the Bay Area Council and we appreciate her and her firm's uh, commitment uh, to this. And so you know, the, the, you know, the background of this, of course, is that Congress recently passed a $1.2 trillion infrastructure measure to fund transportation and water and broadband and electric, uh, electric grid infrastructure and uh, this is the largest investment uh, in, you know, on the on the transportation side. It's the largest investment in rail transit since, since Congress uh, created uh, Amtrak 50 years ago. So it's the equivalent of 18 years of typical funding for rail in just one bill. So for those of you uh, who are listening on in on our rail advocates, which I think is probably most of you, if I know my members right. Uh, you know, this is a really, really big deal. We want to understand just how big. In terms of numbers, it's $681 billion in funding in two parts. It's, the re it's in effect, the reauthorization of the uh, five-year surface transportation bill, uh, plus over $150 billion in supplemental one-time stimulus funding to be distributed through, through more than a couple of dozen uh, grant programs over the five-year period until 2026. And perhaps the most unprecedented element of the deal is over hundred billion in competitive grants that could uh, really play a mean meaningful material difference in Bay Area projects. So uh, we're gonna talk today with uh, Congressman uh, DeSaulnier who had uh, his hands in this in a big way and Teresa McMillan who can't wait to get her hands on the money uh, that comes to distribute it to all the right places and Darlene G, who uh, re really understands the application of how you know funding matters and how to put it uh, best to work. So I'm going to ask each of you a couple of you know questions in turn. And I think you know from just uh, from the Bay Area, the Bay Area Council has been at this for uh, pretty much our entire 76 years. We're the group that created BART, uh, the Bay Area uh, Water Transit Authority, now WIDA, which I happen to chair, you know, ferry service. Uh, we were behind funding of transit in many different initiatives over many, many years. Most region, re, recent one, Regional Measure 3, which hopefully one day the California Supreme Court will turn back the funds to the Bay Area so we can, we can start funding the 35 or so projects that were part of that. But, uh, and, uh, but it's more than that. It's part of the Bay Area Council's uh, kind of core competence, and it's in our blood to bind this region together with a great transportation system. So uh, as I said, Congressman DeSonia, I'll start with you. You serve on the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. If you could, this must have been such a big deal for you. Uh, if you could put a little context around the numbers and, you know, if you could explain maybe how this is different than previous 
transportation reauthorizations we've seen over the years. And, you know, finally, maybe I know you've been a great friend uh, of Congressman DeFazio, who chairs the committee who recently announced his retirement from the Congress. You know, what impact will or might that have uh, on the landscape? So, uh, Congressman DeSonia, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks, Jim, and thanks for asking me. It's wonderful to be part of this discussion. I appreciate all your hard work, both personally and the organization. You're so important um, for the Bay Area, for California, but really for the country. How we do this um, is very, very important. So I feel honored. It's a delight to see Therese. Um, my Forrest Gumpian career in transportation in the Bay Area uh, follows parallels Teresa's, uh, well, I can't remember, I, 1996, I think I went on the commission, um, three or four executive directors. So I, I think I drove them all crazy, <laughs> but I, I wanted to be constructive in my personality. Um, it's been fascinating. Uh, it, it, we're gonna miss Peter a lot. Thank you for helping me uh, host him, um, taking him on that helicopter ride to show him our congestion problems in the Bay Area some years ago. Uh, Peter is an institutionalist and he understands the subject matter backwards and forwards. And it was a real, I think, a statement um, for people who are institutionalists. Uh, people hear a lot about uh, the Congress and members, but people like Peter are really a role model for somebody who developed an expertise in this field um, that all the members and the staff could rely on. And this is, uh, along with Speaker Pelosi, uh, two wonderful West Coast leaders in the Congress. Um, this is sort of, sort of the opus in many ways, certainly for Peter's career, uh, in some ways for mine, um, although I think I have some time left. Uh, and for the Bay Area, it's really important. So um, in Congress right now, to be able to do something this big that has been so hard to do for so long uh, in the, is, is a huge accomplishment and to get it signed into law. It was wonderful to be at the White House uh, not far from the president when he signed it. I am the vice president of California. Um, but now, now comes the really exciting work, I think, um, is how we put these funds out in a social model that has changed on the course of time um, since the last big investment, not just in rail, but in infrastructure in this country. And the Bay Area is a leader in that. Um, two income households, um, lots of people doing lots of commutes and trying to get in density having uh, increased in the Bay Area in California. Uh, in the la then I'll just end with the next part of the package, uh, childcare um, is an important, important part of this infrastructure. Uh, when we look at uh, the pressures on two income households in the last 30 or 40 years, childcare is part of infrastructure. Um, elder care is part of how we take care of our grandparents and our parents as they live longer um, are all part of infrastructure. So I, it's been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful experience the last 12 months, six months to see this, this successfully go through and the amazing leadership of the business community nationally, um, but particularly in the Bay Area and also the president and his staff and his cabinet secretaries and the legislature. So wonderful partnership, but now comes the really exciting work of how we actually put this money into real work so that generations will benefit from it in their quality of life and the Bay Area will continue to be um, sort of a city on the hill for the rest of the world to look at. Well, uh, it's really critical uh, to us. Uh, you know, we've been waiting a long time. So I want to thank you for your leadership on this. And we know that this wasn't easy. We all watched this. Uh, people were taking bets on whether or not it could happen or not. And, you know, everything is probably more complicated than it needs to be. But thank you. And you know, we look forward to working with you as we sort of work through the nuts and bolts of this. And speaking of the nuts and bolts, so, so Therese, uh, you, know, <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot of discretionary funds that are coming uh, here, or at least in the bill. And so how do we assure, I was in Los Angeles the couple of, for the last couple of days, and I know the folks there are very excited as well. And, you know, they've got the Olympics and this isn't really an LA versus Bay Area conversation isn't the intention, but, you know, how do we, how do we make sure that, and what role will MTC play in making sure that we get our fair share of the funds towards implementing uh, Plan Bay Area uh, 2050? And, uh, 
you know, I, I, obviously I just would like to get your kind of take as someone who's been really experienced with this and been around, you know, just how big is this? And one other question I wanted to ask you about PEPRA because we're reading about, you know, the decision, that, you know, the, the, you know, the Department of Labor's decision to deny funds over the act in 2013 when we voted to change our pension system, you know, what, what, what's happening to make sure that in the end, you know, we get the funds that we, we need and deserve. Yeah, um, well, that's that's a big set of questions, Jim. And yeah. I think it, you know, what's interesting about it, I think it matches just the big amount of money that we have. I mean, the scale, as Congressman Desaulnier pointed out, of resources made available, you know, nationally and then to the states and the regions here, it's just unprecedented. That said, I don't think we're in a position of being overwhelmed by it because we've done a lot of the foundational work. Um, and I'm so glad that you mentioned Plan Bay Area 2050 because that's the vision, that's the plan. We spent four years identifying a whole array of infrastructure needs, you know, significantly transportation, um, but also housing and also climate and resilience, which I think allowed us in the latter category to make headway influencing powers that be in, in um, Washington that climate and resistance needs to be a special focus area of this next generation of infrastructure. And that's incredibly exciting to be able to see that, you know, really in the mix in a very specific way. So our plan has identified, I think, investment priorities, um, particular projects, you know, we, we've identified a lot of projects and, and, and sort of their alignment in the pipeline in terms of being ready for certain fund sources. Um, really importantly, you know, MTC will be relying on that as sort of our North Stout star to pivot from in terms of identifying the specific steps that may need to be attached to any particular program. Um, you know, from my time in Washington, and uh, Congress de Saulnier will certainly know this, the, there's a lot that goes into the rules and regs that underlie what Congress puts forward. It's its own thing. And, you know, the decisions on specific eligibilities, on the timing of, of funds, on the criteria, and, and as you pointed out, Jim, in this discretionary arena, there is a lot of decision making left to do. So one thing the region can do is help marshal and pivoting from our plan. And I think the extraordinary articulation of need that we have here is communicate that to make sure that these rules and regs coming down for these programs are reflective and, and help establish a, a, a good competitive position for us in terms of in terms of the you know whether it's transit, whether it's you know multimodal active transportation resilience, whatever the case may be, um, being able to influence it there is important. The other thing though is sort of readying projects to jump in and use this funding, and that's uh, also a really important role that MTC has always played, but I think is particularly important here. There is no major project in this region that will be totally funded by federal money. I mean, that hasn't been the case for like ever. So it's really about the leveraging and the packaging and how you stagger and put things together. And in a region with 27 different transit agencies, and I can just imagine ages 101 different cities, that's an art as much as a skill set. And the business community, you know, has played a really essential role sometimes in helping sort through how those coalitions are built in terms of the amounts and types of funding that go together to put together the, you know, a funding plan for a major project, which now we're all having to get used to talking about billions of dollars instead of millions, right? And that brings with it a really significant amount of accountability to our public. And I think, you know, I'd love to hear Darlene and the Congressman's perceptions here, but if we're going to, ask for this money, we need to be able to demonstrate proof of concept on the ground, we can deliver stuff. And that gets to, I think, a really significant regional conversation about project delivery, um, particularly in that mega project realm. And I expect that that MTC 
will help facilitate that discussion going forward. It's been raised, you know, prior to, you know, the, the um, you know, infrastructure bill being done, but it's one that deserves, you know, our collective attention. So I'll stop there. Yeah. Can you just comment quickly on PEPRA and, you know, oh, PEPRA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can really comment to the extent for folks that, that know what it is in brief, because it's quite complex. Um, transit funding grants need not only the approval of the US DOT, but also the US Department of Labor that from a, a long standing provision in the law needs to, you know, they need to make a determination that the circumstances surrounding the grant in no way impede on the collective bargaining rights of transit unions. That's probably the simplest way of, of framing it. And then back in 2013, I was actually at the Federal Transit Administration at the time, so know this pretty well. Um, there was a challenge made that PEPRA, which is, and I, I'm going to not be able to spell out the entire acronym, but this was the very significant action that the state of California took to reform pension um, structure throughout the state of California through all sectors and disciplines um, to ensure the financial stability of public employment, uh, employer uh, pension systems. And the challenge made at the time was that that broad action um, um, interfered with the collective bargaining rights of transit unions. Long story short, it was taken up in the courts um, with, with the USDOL, USDOL being the plaintiff um, in the state of California, um, uh, um, you know, defending itself. And the court found in favor basically of the state that it did not interfere with that. Um, so, so, the US eventually US DOL issued a administrative ruling, if you will, clarifying that circumstance. However, because it was an administration action, the current administration has gone back to its original perspective that it does interfere. It's basically revisiting the situation that was first flagged in 2013. Um, so at this point, while the, while the USDOT and FTA in particular has said, keep moving your grants forward because this isn't yet settled, DOL is not taking action, which means that the grants are bo bollocked up. And there is a, um, the, the one thing I will say, because I'm not personally attached to it, but our understanding is that there has been a request by the state to have the court, because um, it's all been filed in the court again, um, grant a stay of the current um, holdup related to the grant so that grants can continue to move until which time the court fully settles the circumstances. And December 21st, we understand, is, is when that determination mm -hmm. by the court will be made. Right. So that's kind of where we are. So. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, let me just say this for all of that procedural stuff. This is a big deal. If transit agencies in California cannot advance their grants, that means we cannot, tack, um, we cannot access remaining critical COVID relief funding, um, particularly under the ARP, which was the third of the three significant tranches of federal assistance that, that Congress made available to deal with COVID. We can't play in the sandboxes of all the discretionary funding opportunities we just talked about. And we can't move forward with our formula bread and butter money. That would be the circumstance. So that's that's why this is a very big deal for us. That's that is a big deal. But if there's anything you know we can do to help as a you know kind of outside advocate to weigh in on the lawsuits or any of those, I know you know you don't handle that aspect of it, but you know, it is it is obviously very, very Concerning. Let, let me turn it to uh, Darlene uh, G from HNTV, who uh, who is uh, involved in some of the region, you know, actually delivering 
the projects from the funds that we receive. And I'll ask Darlene to talk about some of those projects. And one I'd ask you to talk about a little more is Link 21, because that's a really big deal and want to know how this could potentially affect uh, uh, all this funding could affect Link 21. Um, but, you know, back to what Teresa's point on accountability, which I think is somewhat baked into the law, you know, how do we make sure we've had some project, let's be uh, upfront in the Bay Area, we've had, we have a number of really big projects that are, you know, have either cost us much more and were delayed, or are costing us much more and are delayed. And, uh, you know, we want to demonstrate to the, you know, to, 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 to ourselves, because we're ultimately going to be going back to the public and asking for more money for transportation. It's a sure thing. It's just a question of when and how, you know, how do we assure the public that we're spending the money properly? And, you know, ha you know, having been right in the middle of this, how do you, how do, how do you see this, uh, Darlene? Well, thank you, Jim. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here this morning and certainly to join such distinguished uh, panelists uh, and Therese and Congressman DeSalne. Um, absolutely, um, it's an exciting time and having the money is, you know, the foundation, that's where you have to start. But um, my perspective, as opposed to Therese and the congressman is, you know, down in the trenches of actually, you know, taking it and um, doing real project delivery. And I, and I think that, um, that there are huge opportunities um, to continue to make that uh, better. And I completely understand, uh, you know, what you're asking, uh, Jim, certainly there's been a lot of, um, a lot of uh, project delivery issues of mega projects. Um, they're very complicated, they're very um, complex, and it takes a lot to make them actually happen on the ground. I think, uh, but again, when I say there's opportunity, I think there's huge opportunity now for the Bay Area, especially in the guise of, um, of this new infrastructure funding to do two things that are incredibly important to success of project delivery. One, everybody has mentioned, and this is a huge role for the Bay Area Council, Jim, and that is um, coming together to have a consensus of you know working together. Working together is a huge factor in making project delivery successful. And then that working together not only has to be amongst a lot of different stakeholders and agencies, but it has to be the collaboration of the public sector and the private sector. Neither, neither element can do it by itself. And I think there's huge opportunities to improve, right? Having spent decades uh, working uh, with public agencies to deliver, there are almost um, unlimited opportunities for, for improving those processes and looking at things in a new way. You mentioned Link 21, which is so exciting because, um, and, and definitely thank you to the Congressman and, and this bill, because this does two things that are so critical for a project like Link 21. It allows monies, federal monies to be used in project development in a way that had never been happened happen before. And it also allows um, multimodal projects like a Link 21 that's looking at both transit and rail, which historically have never been able to come together in the funding pools to actually be able to tap in to um, the $10 billion um, uh, allocation for that. So, I, and I think, and I think bringing in best practices from the world, Jim, there's always been a tendency, certainly in the Bay Area, certainly in California, uh, we're not interested if it's not invented here. But one of the things that we're bringing to bear in Link 21 that I think is so exciting, and I'm happy to see that it is being um, embraced, and that is, um, uh, some of you may have heard about the decision process called StageGate. It's really uh, brought in from the UK, it's really brought in from the major rail uh, programs where they've tackled, you know, things that are just uh, amazing. And, and StageGate in its most simplified description is a much more formal decision-making process where you don't lurch forward into the next stage until you really have that buy-in of everything, you know, is ready to move to that next stage. And I can certainly tell you from firsthand and all of you um, can see, you know, from every different level that um, one of the big challenges over the years in the Bay Area 
has been, you know, what I would call an endless do loop of second guessing. Um, it has caused uh, incredible uh, cost overruns, delays, all of the things that paint the ugly picture of project delivery not going well. So I, I think it's very exciting and I think more agencies and I think all of us collectively have got to work to convince, you know, all of our uh, very, very good agencies to, to open, be open-minded, think about new ways that this can be done and not be so rigid in has to always be done the same way over and over. Thank, thank you very much for uh, that observation. And you know, I think I'll follow that to back to Congressman uh, Desaulnier. So, you know, talk a little more about what, you know, is in the bill to assure project oversight, uh, public private uh, uh, cooperation or partnerships, if that's the case. And you, you've been such a big uh, advocate for a system wide approach that we shouldn't think about just projects, we need to think about how it all fits together. So if you would you know, talk about that a little bit and you know, share your philosophy and how what we're doing here could potentially support that so that we get, eventually we get the kind of system that really works uh, so much better for so many more people. Yeah, great question. Uh, let me just, as a lead into that, Darlene uh, reminded me of a trip when I was an MTC commissioner and we had a, discussion in London, and I asked the executive director uh, in, of the London equivalent of MTC why they had made so many changes, directly elected mayor, um, all these amazing, and I said, such a tradition bound culture in London, and the response was, we've always prided ourselves on being a financial center of the world. We used to have to compete with Manhattan and New York. Now we have to compete with San Francisco, um, yeah. probably 25 years ago. But he used the expression. He said, you know, here in London, we have an expression. If it wasn't invented here, we don't do it here. Um, and that's one of Darlene, I think that's a good point. And I know Teresa and I and her predecessor, uh, in particular, we had many discussions about this, is not um, resting on our loyal laurels as the culture of the Bay Area that's been is so unique, a continuing look for new ideas and best practices and not being afraid of, of implementing them. So whether it's project delivery or um, systems management. So to your point, Jim, there's a lot in here. Uh, the chairman and I had a lot of discussions as you can imagine from, um, and his staff and my staff, from the level of mega projects, there's language in there about mega projects. Uh, Teresa, I was invited to an event at the Transbay Terminal on Saturday with the speaker and high-speed rail. Uh, and the, the Transbay Terminal or the eastern span of the Bay Bridge brings up lots of post-traumatic stress for me and probably for you on management of those mega projects. But um, there's a lot in here. And, and to Teresa's uh, comment, and all of you know this, the implementation of these regulations are critical. So we got this part done. But given the scale of this, and the scale isn't as, as you mentioned, and I think Therese mentioned, the biggest component, the biggest bill that I got in here was around infrastructure, given my background representing the Bay Area on CARB for 10 years. If the, the financial markets globally are moving towards battery electric and fuel cells, um, fossil fuel cars are gone. And then combined with that is California has run out of land. Um, so we're now doing the density that sort of was a chicken and egg on Fairbox recovery um, that other developed countries have, London, China, or Japan. So the infrastructure is really, the oversight's really complicated, but important. We're changing our energy source. We're changing the fleet in the next 50 years. Um, so my bill on the infrastructure started as a grant program and the administration said, this is our, one of our biggest priorities. So electric charging stations, I always say the Chinese are adding a hundred thousand new charging stations a month. The United States only has 42,000 and about 20% of those are in, um, California in the Bay area as early adapters in the homes of Tesla. All of these require a lot a lot of oversight, but we got to get this right. And this is where the relationship with you, the business community, um, and with MTC and with the county agencies in, in the Bay Area is so important. 
um, that we've got this pass, but now how we do the project development, get the projects out, have proper oversight, but not too much oversight, the right oversight to deliver the projects in a systems management. And the last component of that is technology. Um, specific projects that are ready to upgrade our, our, um, our congestion management funds and other CMAC funds that we've been nibble and diming it with for a long time. Now these are going to go into overdrive. So all of the system, uh, the transportation system, the traffic si systems will get this really up to date sustainable infrastructure that will be monitoring the whole system to move people faster. That, that uh, sounds very exciting and very different uh, than what we've experienced. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, you know, hopeful that we can deliver all that. I know in the times I've spent in China, um, you know, we watched in, as uh, Shanghai was preparing for the 2010 uh, you know, the Ch Expo, I think they built 180 new subway stations to prepare for that. That's just one thing that they did. Uh, and built underground roads and really uh, alleviated their traffic congestion. At the same time, the country was building at that time, I think about 10,000 miles of high speed, speed rail, which has grown since then. And they're moving to next generation high speed rail and we don't have high speed rail in America yet. So, uh, you know, this is something I think we really need to focus on if we wanna be competitive and offer the public a quality of life. You know, we need to make these kinds of investments. We, we obviously, we obviously need um, to do it right. Um, Therese, you know, talk a, a little more about, you know, how this funding will come down and what, you know, how MTC will, how you think you'll be managing this. And uh, may, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the projects you mentioned in uh, Plan Bay Area 2050, you know, you've got it boiled down to the project level. So I think we're kind of talking in highfalutin terms here. So, uh, and I'm not sure everyone knows what Link 21 actually is. So, you know, what, uh, what, what will we be seeing in the Bay Area in the next iteration in transportation as a result of this funding and other plans and funding? Uh, what can we expect? Well, I think there's a, there's a, there's a couple of things that probably, um, you know, can pivot off some of the foundational comments I made at the beginning. You know, one of the really important things here, um, Jim, is I don't want to underestimate the incredible importance of the increase in the formula funds, because a huge part of what Plan Bay Area pointed out is the aging infrastructure in this region, right? right. So, you know, for transit, this is the continual investment in, um, you know, replacing rail, replacing the buses. Importantly, as we were just talking about, getting ready for a next generation of infrastructure, whether, you know, the electrification of the fleet and the like is all really important. But, it, you know, these formula funds are going to be critical in being able to keep the ship moving. Like, you know, we scrub the decks and make them shinier, perhaps. But that's, a really big deal. That's just hundreds of billions of dollars. I don't even remember the number off the top of my head, but you know, it's floating around like $140 billion is the state of good repair. Our bridges, huge deal, right? I mean, this is a significant level of infrastructure across the nation, not just the big iconic bridges like you know, the Bay Bridge and Golden Gate and whatnot, which clearly we work very closely with the state on how you know we manage those. But just highway bridges, anytime it's not touching the ground, it's a bridge. <laughs> and, you know, the state um, has gotten a really significant and critical plus up in, you know, the funding available for that. And the bridge needs across the state of California are really huge. So we need to partner with Caltrans to make sure that whatever investment decisions they're going through in terms of Northern California, Southern California, Central, you know, we, we get into those that foundational element. So that might be the less glamorous part of, you know, the work that we'll be doing, but it's a crucial, crucial part of it. Beyond that, one of the things, as I mentioned before, that we're beginning to look at is of the many, many projects that have been identified in um, Plan Bay Area 2050 is some notion of which projects based on what we know, again, with the rules still being developed, might compete well for 
um, the federal discretionary funds. So, you know, as we mentioned, um, there are uh, projects, you know, on the books, whether it's BART to Silicon Valley, you know, the second part of that, or Deridon Station or downtown, um, you know, DTX, the uh, downtown um, uh, extension there, Caltrain electrification. I mean, there's, and that's just on the transit side, right? Where we have a number of complex projects that first and foremost, we need to figure out how to advance, uh, how to make sure that we can keep those moving in the most efficient way possible. Um, and, you know, they've got, you know, funding gaps that we need to collectively figure out, you know, how to fill. Um, there is all manner though of um, local community projects. One of the things that Plan Bay Area advanced that's very important focus is going to be where we invest. And are we investing in our communities that are most vulnerable in the Bay Area? That's gonna be a really important focus. And one of the things that's very exciting for us is that the smaller scale level investments, which is sometimes in the millions of dollars, but compared to billions, it's a big deal, is you know, particularly for um, active transportation, safety projects, pedestrian projects, the types of things that can knit a community together. We're setting up a program to work in partnership with our cities and counties, our congestion, um, uh, um, uh, our, our county transportation agencies, the CTAs that kind of help glue those local interests together, um, our equity social justice communities to help us identify the types of investments that are important in communities that have often been left behind in infrastructure. That's going to be a very important uh, focus for the commission. And one that I'm grateful that the biz co business community has recognized as a very important lens on which you know to put to put our focus. Um, there's a number of um, I guess the one thing I would say to there, like keep posted because just watch our website and our committee agendas because we bring a lot of things forward. Um, there's something that we call um, OBAG3, the One Bay Area Grant Program, which for those of you that are familiar is a multimodal investment program that you know is benefiting from a plus up in, in um, the underlying funds, the STP and CMAC funds that, that support that, and will be leveraged by a number of other funds we you know made available, um, both from the state as well as, as the federal government. Um, that has been a longstanding um, partner generated program that is coming to the commission in the spring. Uh, OBAG3, the next big round of that investment. And as one example, here's an, um, a situation where things like the Blue Ribbon Transit Recovery Task Force work the you were part of, Jim, um, we spent 18 months, you know, in the height of COVID, really thinking about how we need to transform transit on many, many, many different levels. And we're now at the opportunity having adopted the Transformational Transit Action Plan of figuring out how do we fund these changes, right? Some of which are programmatic, like um, coming up with a much better integrated fare system. Others are gonna be investments. Um, you know, how do we get buses out of traffic? You know, what, what are the, again, not the super big investments, but really critical investments, say on our express lane systems or on our major arterial road systems so that buses can really travel and offer, offer a reliable option. Um, all of those are coming in the next few months. And, um, you know, it'll be really important to continue the dialogue that we establish between business and our stakeholder communities, our transit providers and, and the commission on how best to take this window and make it work for the types of customer-driven reforms that we've been talking about for a long time. That's, you know, I hope uh, folks listen carefully uh, to what you're saying, because I think you gave a really great, you know, the, the breadth of things that are happening, all happening rather quickly, necessitated by the changes that I think the Congressman laid out. And, you know, it's a different world and you're having to make some, you know, really important decisions. And, you know, I appreciate your comments on the bridges. I, you know, we, we sometimes knock Caltrans, but when you travel around our state, you see these amazing 
uh, you know, amazing examples of, you know, world-class infrastructure that, you know, make, make California special, you know, it's worth noting. And, uh, you know, the, I think the first thing you said when you took the job, at least that I heard, is it, there was going to be an equity, uh, transportation equity first approach, not just transportation, but housing as well, and how we, you know, recognize that, you know, we're not going to leave out communities because just because they've historically been left out. In fact, we're going to focus in the opposite way. So, you know, we're happy to be your ally and partner in making sure that happens. I will say in, at, at our water transit agency, which I chair WIDA, uh, you know, a couple of things is we, you know, as you know, we've changed our service to actually uh, bring in more folks who've historically been left out of being able to be on ferries, more service workers, uh, go, you know, spending, you know, uh, uh, making better use of our new Richmond facility and, you know, really focusing on those communities to sort of change the makeup of people who are able to avail themselves of the ferries, uh, uh, slice the fares in half. So these are some, you know, things I think with your leadership, we're really looking hard at. And the other part on water transit is that we've, uh, we've cut a deal with CARB for the future, and we are going to become a zero emission uh, ferry system. I think the, certainly the first in this country and at this scale, maybe in the world. And all, all we have to do is now figure out how to do it. So we're working very hard to figure out how to how to make that happen. Uh, you know, I think that's kind of job one and probably our biggest challenge besides just bringing folks back in uh, who, you know, since the commute patterns have changed so much, how do we get the passengers, which every transit system is facing? I know uh, Congressman DeSonia has to leave, so I wanted to hit you with one final, uh, ask you for one final observation. So, you know, th there is this sort of concept, which wasn't in the bill of member directed uh, funding, or I think we used to call these things earmarks. And, I, you know, we're not seeing that at this time. Do you think we'll see that again in the future? And what do you think about what do you think about you know members like yourself being able to say you know there's this project we really need to get done and if you want me on this bill you need to do that project i think they're really important um so i was lucky enough on the transportation side to get the maximum number of projects and the maximum amount of funding um again working closely with you and uh my transportation agency in Contra Costa. Um, and then we, we did the same thing in appropriations uh, with uh, Chair DeLuro, who's terrific and a good friend. We still are trying to get both of them in a appropriations uh, bill. So I haven't given up hope. Um, and the trick to this is not having based on just political relationships, which got us in trouble on these things, um, but having, as Therese said, one of the reasons we were so successful is because MTC and the county agencies did their work so well that when we submitted them, they were the, they were the template for the country. Um, the, the staff and the chairman said, they already did all the oversight, boom, let's get this money out and get these projects going. So I, I, I'm still very hopeful that that that'll happen. Um, I do have to go. I really appreciate it. I just want to thank you all for doing this and tell you how excited I am to be part of the Bay Area team. Um, we have such a wonderful opportunity for future generations to really deliver for them. And, you know, we have some unique political um, and geographic challenges. And when we, uh, Therese was part of this, uh, when the MTC went to Congress and went to Sacramento as one with one voice with the business community and other stakeholders, um, we really had an impact. And I think we can continue to do that and really be a, a national and international model for project delivery in a whole system that improves people's qualities of quality of lives for generations. So Jim, thank you so much for all that you do. And uh, my last observation is we should have a Jeopardy category for acronyms and abbreviations for Bay Area transportation. Yeah. We run into some problems in that area. We're always reminding ourselves that not ne not necessarily everyone knows what the heck we're talking about. But that's the isn't that the purpose of government is to sort of you know no. at least we're not in the healthcare field. No. Uh, I'll take uh, I'll take we do for twenty. Bob. Impossible. You no one knows. Even I don't even think they know. But who would know if they know? So if that, I'll we'll let you go uh, and hopefully see you when uh, when you're back. And I hope you get back soon. I'm excited about working with all of you. Thank you for inviting me. Have a great holiday.
Th thank you. Um, so let, uh, we've got some questions, and I, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can summarize them. But before I do it, Darlene, maybe a little bit more on Link 21. You know, this is a huge, maybe you could sort of describe the enormity of it. And maybe in context of that and transportation funding in general, uh, you know, we've got these funds, which is terrific, but it's bigger than that. Where, where is the funding going to come for transportation for our region in the future? What do you think needs to be done? Well, certainly, um, Jim, I, and to, to back up, and, and if there is, are people that may not uh, know the full breadth of Link 21, I mean, Link 21 is really a transformational, um, you know, generational type project. It is a rail project where it's, you know, um, the, um, the piece that is most often focused on is the idea of a second um, Bay Area crossing uh, for rail. Um, long way from exactly, you know, is that BART, is that um, other rail, is that both, um, all of that is to be determined. Uh, probably one of the most exciting things about Link 21 is its attempt to do many things that Therese mentioned, which is, you know, to, um, to provide a much more integrated mega region system, a much better passenger experience, and to do it with very much of a focus on an equity lens of how does this affect communities, people, um, the ability for um, you know, various priority populations to really be able to, to utilize a much better networked system of access and mobility. So very exciting. It's being led right now by BART and Capital Corridor and uh, much, much to come. Um, but probably uh, one of the most exciting, you know, new ideas of taking a lot of old ideas and bringing them together and um, again, accomplishing um, hopefully at some point another crossing of the bay. In terms of where the money is going to come from, Jim, hopefully you're going to be part of helping. Uh, the Bay Area Council always is and are many other uh, good organizations in the Bay Area. But as Therese mentioned, nothing gets done solely with federal money. There's got to be local money. Um, Link 21 hopefully will, you know, at some point, hopefully, as we continue to move out of this pandemic, as we continue to look at more investment in the Bay Area, uh, that there will be other regional measures. Hopefully we can come together. Um, you know, we certainly have all participated in looking at that in the past, being part of that. There's been so much over the years with the counties, the self-help counties, um, so many aspects of transportation funding. So indeed, I think that, that there is still going to be very much of a need for coming together, working together to create regional funding sources. As you said at the beginning, this is not about LA versus the Bay Area, but as we all know, LA has a huge advantage in being much more cohesive with the number of agencies and the structure than the Bay Area does. So this coming together is no, no small thing. It's a huge aspect to can we really fund the excitement that everybody's talking about in transportation. Yeah, what's so fascinating is, you know, they envy the Bay Area. They look and they, they wonder how we're able to do what we do. And then we look right back and envy them for having the ability to have passed, you know, this mega measure of, a, I think it's $130 billion uh, in funds. But, you know, they're one county and we've got at least nine here, right? And it's a little more challenging. But we, we've we shown, you know, that we can get the legislature to put a me help us put a measure before the public. I think that, you know, the, the real question is going to be what is that, what, what constitutes that measure and how do we convince the public, uh, you know, to this conversation that we can spend the funds effectively. Could you quickly comment on labor? Because, you know, I, I hear news stories of uh, COVID vaccine centers shutting down because there's not enough people to work in them. And, you know, if we're going to pump this much money into transportation, will we have the workforce to actually deliver? Oh, that is a huge challenge, Jim. I would be very shocked if there is anyone on this call whose organization is not already experiencing the challenges of what's usually called the war for talent. I have read some very fascinating articles in the last few months that if you took all of the resources nationally in engineering, architecture, construction, there is not enough total um, to deliver um, you know, what is envisioned in, in all of the 
infrastructure um, monies. Um, the good news is all of this doesn't have to happen overnight and it can't happen overnight. But as you well know, the pandemic, generational changes in careers, workforce outlooks, um, the, uh, the pressures over the years of probably two generations of people being much more interested in the, in the technology world than the more old fashioned infrastructure world. There are so many aspects to it, but I can honestly say, and I think everybody knows this, treat your talent uh, well. And again, that word flexible and thinking through how you're going to have your workforce because there is just not enough people in the system yeah. Um, when you take what's coming into the system, when you take the people that are retiring out of it. And I know that one of the areas that's very near to Barry, our council's heart and so many people, and um, I'm sure the congressman would have agreed that, you know, this is also a huge area for education, vocational training, community college. There has just got to be more in the system because right now, you know, right now the pressures of, um, you know, the talent and the mobility of that talent is just enormous. So yeah. huge topic. And, and just to, to jump in, because I think the point Darlene made is so critical, you know, with all the challenges we've just articulated, the opportunity in workforce development, I think is really crucial back to that, you know, the equity um, element as well. I think there are critical partnerships for focused training. Um, community colleges, again, you know, this idea when I was worked at the um, with the Obama administration, there had been an initiative looking at how transit could pair with community colleges who could pair with um, um, the private sector who was needing these jobs to be able to say, what are the skill sets that you need? How do we train, you know, the next generation of folks to prepare for that? As you've pointed out, Jim, this wave of electrification, this is a whole new game plan. This is not, this is about new training in maintenance, new training in, um, you know, potentially in operations, um, a whole slew of ideas. We need to not gallop after it, but anticipate it. And particularly in the workforce development arena, I think there's some really exciting opportunities for partnerships, private sector and public sector together to, to uh, respond to that. Yeah, th thank you. And, uh, you know, whatever it, the Bay Area Council run, has a, a very effective workforce program and we're focused on apprenticeships. And I think this is one of those moments for the public sector, the community college system, the other training institutions, workforce improvement boards, uh, the investment boards, the uh, building trades unions um, to really come together and think about, OK, we, this is a huge opportunity, but one we'll miss if we're not able to, you know, fully staff our vision. So, you know, that's that, and, and, you know, on the positive side, there's some really good future jobs out there for people who might otherwise, you know, uh, you know, leave the Bay Area because they can't find a good job. So, you know, the upside of this is also really great as well. Um, I you don't have the time to get to all of the questions, but uh, let's take a couple. Um, Gene Schneer asked about autonomous vehicles. So uh, maybe Therese, what do you think, you know, how does uh, the future with autonomous vehicles coming uh, and we're at the epicenter of that, how is that going to affect um, signalization controls? How, you know, how do we fit, how do we have a system that works with what we know is coming? We touched on it a little bit. Well, you know, this is a, a, an arena where, again, public private partnership has some really important opportunities. Um, you know, um, uh, Randy Iwasaki and um, the, the Contra Costa um, uh, Transportation Association have been doing a lot of really innovative work in testing and piloting um, how, you know, AVs can work in the region. Um, there is significant support, again, emerging support, both in the on the federal side as well as the state side to you know look at how could this work for transit right is there a whole different way of moving people more effectively in terms of you know link you know closely linking you know buses that can talk to each other in you know long trains and the like so partly i think jim um and, 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 and dare I say, um, this is, you know, partnerships with our academic institutions of which the Bay Area is extraordinarily rich is another, you know, thing to, to really focus on. 
But one of the things that I find intriguing is this idea of the not to preclude focus. Like, you know, in designing, in, in designing streets, to your point, in designing, um, um, you know, do we need parking lots anymore? And what do those parking structures look like? Um, those are the types of things where even if we don't have the right answers right now, because everything is in place to implement it tomorrow, being able to make sure that we're anticipating it to design for tomorrow in a way that doesn't preclude bringing these new technologies on is a really important aspect and a new part of planning, I think, that speaks to planning and engineering and architecture and the like, also in an exciting new space. And because, um, you know, how often have we planned for the old and then had to tear it down or make, do major modifications to get to the new? And I think this is, again, an opportunity where we need to change our thinking and how to, you know, again, be in that transitional space that for um, policy wonks like myself can be <laughs> a really, you know, interesting, exciting place. Yeah. To be. yeah. Um you know, maybe la last question is, uh, you know, we're looking into the future and we're thinking about funding and, you know, capital and how we're going to grow the system. But in the meantime, you know, we're having an awfully difficult time in the Bay Area getting people back onto mass transit uh, at our at the WIDA agency. I think we're around 40 percent pre-pandemic and we're good uh, compared to some other agencies. And, uh, you know, what, what do you think is holding people back? We're seeing you know, pretty much full traffic at the Bay Bridge toll, maybe not at the same times of day, but, you know, we're no, there's no, uh, you know, heavy traffic and congestion is back on our roads, and yet our trains and buses are pretty darn empty. Uh, there's a question from Shelley London about COVID and how we monitor safety, and, you know, that's probably a, one of the big reasons why people aren't coming back at this point, but how do you see this? Because the implicate, people don't come back, the implications are uh, incredible. Well, I mean, that's, I, I, I wish I had the Heavy. crystal ball. Yeah. You know, I think it's it's very multi-layered. Um, you know, we, we cannot underestimate the effect of the pandemic in changing, I think, a fundamental way of how people just view moving through the world. And, and <laughs> You know, and then you and I have been very involved in this question, you know, remote work, you know, this idea, we had this living laboratory of many people, not all, mind you, and that becomes a big equity question, but a large number of folks being able to do their jobs very effectively from home, which at least theoretically, and I think proof of concept, gets traffic off the roads, particularly during peak periods and the like. That said, there's the economic impacts. I mean, there's this continual adjustment in downtown San Francisco, of course, is just rethinking the whole office ecosystem and, and how that's going to react. And transit, of course, was involved in getting a lot of people to that ecosystem. Well, if that foundationally changes, it's not that transit can't adapt. But in this area of uncertainty, I think we just need the time to do it. And we need to have the sustainable investments. Thank goodness. Thank you again, Congressman de Saulnier and the entire, you know, um, you know, Speaker Pelosi and the like. Um, and, and of course, you know, the Senate and giving us resources to, to ride the tide still, to, you know, to, uh, until we can fix it. I think it's going to mean we have to look at our future far more flexibly than we have. And I've used the term before, we have to stop, and I think we have, but we've moved beyond looking in the rear view mirror, trying to get back to February, 2020, to through the front windshield to say, even with all this uncertainty, what are the different ways of how our future might be? And are we positioned to pivot to those new realities? Yeah. And that's, that's a different perspective. And it's a hard one. Folks like certainty, right? And they go back to what they used to know as a period. And we got to move beyond that. And I think we're doing a good job here. And the work that we all collectively did with the Blue Ribbon Task Force again, I think was huge in terms of being able to demonstrate and set in place a, a collective ownership of the uncertainty 
but a confidence that we can get through it. Yeah. It's certainly exciting to have a region-wide network manager who be that begins to play a role of, you know, connect really connecting our agencies and our operations and our plans and our schedules and our fares, you know, in the future, wayfinding and those kinds of things that, uh, you know, sort you know, talk about one Bay Area, you know, we need to be one Bay Area and that's MTC's uh, role. Well, look, uh, speaking of time, we're out of it. Um, and I wish we had more because there's more ground to cover and there's a number of questions if you check, uh, you know, we'll try to get answers to those. But I want to thank you, uh, Therese, for your incredible uh, leadership. And I you know you're really busy and taking the time. And so so with you, Darlene, you've got a full plate and you, you always you always come through for us. I want to thank our team, uh, Gwen Litvak, our SVP who manages uh, transportation, and Frank Holland, our uh, our Washington-based uh, uh, team member uh, who helped and always helps us kind of, uh, you know, think through issues and uh, works with the members of Congress uh, to make sure that the Bay Area's voice is heard, at least in terms of the way the Bay Area Council sees it. So uh, thank you, team, and, and Justin Sider for organizing this webinar and uh, really doing a great job of pulling it off. And uh, Chanel, thank you very much for uh, delivering uh, Congressman DeSalme, Chanel uh, Scales Preston. So thank you, folks. Um, let's work together. I think that's the major message of this uh, and, and really show what the Bay Area can deliver as a region when it comes to transportation and infrastructure. We need to do it and we can do it and we will. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.